to the Ghost of Heron Hall. My name's McKelly. And I'm Simon. Thank you for joining us for episode 202 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George R.R. R. Martin. Today, we're going to be discussing chapter 58 of A Storm of Swords. That's Tyrion 7. As always, we'll chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you, and hopefully provide you with some entertainment along the way. We'll summarize what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondences. Be sure to check out our show notes. They provide some additional information about the characters and other things of note about the chapter. How are you? I am fine. How are you? I, I'm i doing fine, but something seems different about you i can't quite put my finger on it um well that's because simon's not here today oh i thought it was just the haircut (laughs) (laughs) i thought maybe simon just got his haircut like me i I inspired him (laughs) why don't you introduce yourself who is this that that we have here well i'm robin i'm simon's younger brother and i'm covering for him today because i sound the most like him out of all of our family <laughs> so i could have had your mom on here with me otherwise well that would have been a, that would have been the second choice but um, <laughs> she would have had to do some speed reading to catch up i think oh uh, well i'm glad to have you thank thank you for doing this for us we we really appreciate you filling in i'm sure you'll do an admirable job of uh Carrying Simon's load here. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, I, it's been something I've been looking forward to. I've been asking, I've been pestering Simon to go on holiday and let me let me have a go. But um, <laughs> um, I'm quite glad Jenny had a go first before me to see how it was done. Um, so I am I'm not. It's not quite as stressful as it was. It would have been. Yeah, you you are now our our second guest host, and uh, we've. We've got uh, a high standard to live up to that was set by Simon and Jenny, but uh, I feel like we're up to it. I, I think we're we're up to the challenge. But uh, so why don't you tell us what is your uh, what your association with the Song of Ice and Fire? Did, have, did you read the books previously? No. Um. To be fair, I'm following the books along with you guys from the start. I've been listening. Um. I did see the television program. I didn't pay an awful lot of attention to it. Uh, there, are, there are quite a lot of things that happen in that. I've just, I'm a little bit like Simon. My memory's not quite this, as bad as Simon, but I am quite a bit younger than him. Um, <laughs> uh, so I've, uh, but I've never read the book, and I'm just going through it with you guys. I listen to it on a Tuesday when I get the the podcast. Um, I follow it quite carefully, and it's. Uh, yeah, it's, it's part of my weekly routine. Now I've got a, a big set of podcasts, but this is one of the ones I look out for. It's uh, it's some of the things that I have or obviously already heard about because he's usually talking about our family meetings. Um, and um, it's always interesting to hear about things going on the other side of the pond. So I'm sure, yeah. That's uh, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm, it's it's so cool that you have stuck with us through two hundred and two episodes. You know, I I've had family members start and they make it usually through like ten to fifteen, and here you are, two hundred and two episodes later, recording an episode. So that's well, I, pretty. Awesome. I must say, I must say, I don't I don't tell Simon too much about my uh, um, about how much I follow it because. Uh, yeah, as I say, he his, his ego needs no massaging. <laughs> uh, now, this is the same Rob that has recorded the videos, <laughs> the, <laughs> the Ghosts of Harrenhal videos on YouTube, which are quite funny. So, uh, yes, uh, we've all appreciated those. Now, I, I will say you um you listened to last week's episode, and you heard me talk about the bald faced hornets that were uh, right above my door, my, my front door to the house. And you sent me a bit of information about bald-faced hornets, hornets that were, it was absolutely terrifying. Would you, <laughs> do you mind re, uh, resharing what you learned when you uh, researched them? Yeah, I, I, was, um, I was very interested. I was, um, I was listening about, the, about your, your trials with um, getting rid of a hornet's nest above your house. I actually... In the work I do, I do actually have to get rid of hornets' nests every now and again, and I was oh. I'm always interested by the professionalism you use and and the way you get hold of people. You, I was 
uh, listening to you talk about you getting your grass cut. Um, <laughs> I, I, cu- I cut the grass here as well, and I was, uh, um, I was very interested in your both of you saying you should go and see what his garden looked like. But to be fair, the there's an old adage about the the, the local builder usually has the worst house. Because, uh, <laughs> right. He hasn't got the time. But uh, the hornet's nest was uh, was very interesting. I was um, I usually just put a plastic bag around them and uh, tie it off uh, as dangerously as possible, um, <laughs> and then r- run away with it. Um, but you obviously get, getting the professionals in. But when I read about those particular hornets, it was um, they were awful. It, I went down a, a bit of a rabbit hole. I paused the podcast and I went onto a website and. It told it, it's uh, um, one of the things was ten of the most horrifying things about bald face horns. <laughs> so there's ten and, horrifying things. <laughs> no, no, no. It was the most, te- the ten most. <laughs> the list was basically endless. Um, but number one of the most important ones was um, that they've got incredible memories and they remember exactly who's offended them and they will fly past people to get to their victims. So, oh wow! I, ho- I hope you were wearing a. A, a president mask when you b- <laughs> hired your guy in because otherwise right. they'll be coming for you yeah i i uh i wish i had uh known this i would have started going outside in- incognito but i had no <laughs> clue <laughs> have you gotten stung no no i've i've never been stung i um, i should have been um remember you, you guys used to talk about micro deaths and um oh right yes yes uh, it's certainly one of them that, um, that, is, that should have sorted me out but uh <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a uh, the, the recurring thing. I was cutting a hedge the other day, and I found a wasp's nest inside. Just and I actually cut into it with a hedge trimmer oh. that I was using. Oh, I was wow. I was halfway. I was on a ladder that was precariously leaning against the hedge, so I was just thinking that's probably about thirty micro deaths. In right, one right. <laughs> uh, the only thing that probably the least dangerous thing was I was using a petrol um, hedge trimmer instead of an electric one because I'm sure I would have cut through the wire at that point. <laughs> Great. Cut through the wire, cut through a wasp's <laughs> nest while on a precariously placed ladder. <laughs> I'm not sure those micro deaths can be calculated. <laughs> <laughs> There's a point where they stop becoming micro, I think. <laughs> yes, yeah, it becomes macro. <laughs> uh, so what... So... You do a lot of these tasks you were just talking about on a pretty regular basis. So, uh, what all do you get up to? You you run a bed and breakfast type farm, is that right? Yes, it's um, it, the Colgites. Um, uh, any of your French listeners will know what they are. They're basically self catering cottages, um, and it's a farm that's got five of them. So three of them are accessible um, for wheelchair users, which is quite a rare thing in France. Um, and I'm the manager, which um, the site manager, which just means I cut the grass, I prepare the properties, and I greet the guests. I'm basically the front of house sort of face uh, okay. for the the owner who lives in the UK. Um, she's actually disabled herself. She works. She's in a wheelchair. Um, so it's quite a. It's an interesting business, but um, we're full at the moment. All five properties are occupied at the moment. We've got five different, very different groups. So it's uh, it's quite busy. It's a bit unfortunate. Yeah. My wife's just started. Um, just started working nights so um me and uh, my stepson are trying to be very very quiet around the house but obviously the clients who are out and about don't know <laughs> anything about that so they just make as much noise but very fortunately on the first day of her of her night shift all the clients went out every single client went out for the okay. whole day except one lady one lady the elderly lady who's staying staying in the in the house the jeep that's next door to our apartment um, she stayed, so we, we were so thankful because the whole site was empty. And then she unpacked her trombone <laughs> and, start, <laughs> and started to practice. And she's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did start to look around. Of all the hobbies for her to have. <laughs> but fortunately, she was doing it upstairs in the bedroom but unfortunately, that's next door to my oh, no. my bedroom. So she was just doing the the what doing the chords for about an hour and a half next to my <laughs> wife's bed as she was trying to get some sleep. So oh no, um, that probably didn't work out very well. <laughs> uh, no, not at all. Uh, well, <laughs> she couldn't have uh, taken up, you know 
painting or journaling or something like that, <laughs> something quiet. She had to have taken up the trombone. <laughs> uh, it was uh, it was quite funny. It made, it made me laugh. It didn't make my wife laugh. But... No, I bet it didn't. <laughs> Another thing, um, you, you talk about you guys talk about your animals and your pets a lot, um, and we have quite a few animals here. Um, but I've got um, I've got a cat called Bonbon, and she's actually my daughter's cat. She's uh, she's the same age as my daughter. She's just about to turn eighteen, so she's quite an elderly cat. Oh yeah, and I'd say. She dislocated her front leg when uh, about a year ago, and oh, uh, because my owner is. Uh, we have other cats on site as well because they're necessary um, to keep the keep the beasts down, um, <laughs> and they they started to beat her up a little bit, so we had to separate her, and I've had to build a um, an apartment for Bon Bon the cat, and it's on the first floor of a building, and she's got a window that she can look out of, and she I open it in the summertime, and she comes and stands outside and just, uh, does, but she can't jump and she can't jump down; it's too high. Um, and the other day we had a storm. And I'd, I'd forgotten about Bonbon, and oh, right. um, she she stepped out onto the windowsill, and the window closed behind her. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> and she spent the whole storm on the windowsill. <laughs> oh no! Oh, no, that but... would that would be that would be about the end of Penny. She gets so scared of storms, <laughs> even when she's safe in the house. I'm not sure she'd survive out there. I just making sure nobody was letting my daughter know because she'd be round as quickly as possible. <laughs> oh uh, man! <laughs> well, she she came through it okay, old Bon Bon. Yeah, she's she's gonna live forever. Just All right. uh, I have a quick question for you because we're coming yeah. to the end of the time. You're making wine. You don't drink though, do you? I do not. No, I I enjoy the kind of. Science process. aspect, yeah, the process. There's a lot of science involved. A lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of massaging the 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 grape must, which you get, which is, we usually get fifty pound, fifty gallon buckets of grape must, which is crushed up grapes, juice, and stems, and you know the process of taking that and turning it into finished wine is is very challenging, but it's also fun. So. Uh, but can I, you, how, without tasting it at the end? I mean, I have to say, I have I have a very bad record. Uh, Simon's probably a, a more connoisseur. Bizarrely, I live in France, but I'm not a very. <laughs> uh, I, I did a I did I used to play in a well I play in a band and uh, the, my guitarist and my bass player are both very very French and um, and they want and that, we all have to bring a drink to the rehearsal. So I'd bring a bottle of wine, but I'd, I'd bring the cheapest I could find, and you can get some <laughs> really cheap stuff in France. Um, and I'd sure. turn up, I'd turn up with this, and they'd just both look at me and just <laughs> utter disdain. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then they they started to they brought a map of of all the regions in France where all the grapes come from, and they'd say, they'd bring a bottle and say, right, this is where this one comes from. Now taste it. Now can you see the difference? Da, da, da. And I'd just nod my head and sort of say, right, yeah, okay, yeah. I had no idea, no concept of it at all. <laughs> and after about six months, they came, they came and said, right, try this one. And I tried it, and they said, now, where do you think it comes from? And I was like, and I just pointed like I usually do it at some region. And they both looked at each other and said, that's the very first bottle you brought when you <laughs> your first rehearsal. <laughs> we were just seeing if it was working, and it's obviously you're a lost cause. <laughs> you're a lost cause. Yeah, uh, it, to me, it all just tastes like wine. You know, like we've we've made Merlot, we've made Old Vine Zin, we've made Cab, uh, Sanvia, so, San so you do taste it? I do. You... I taste it. Um, I can usually tell when, so, you know, you have to balance the pH. I can usually tell if the pH is too high or too low. Right. But I can't tell you whether it's good wine. I rely on Stacy. So I don't know. I, I really don't know if she knows what she's talking about or not. <laughs> we could be giving away the good stuff and keeping the crap. I have no idea. Excellent. All right. Well, we should probably get down to business at this point and see where Tyrion Lannister was last time we caught up with him. Last we saw of Tyrion, he was learning that Rob and Cat Stark were dead. He witnessed the first clash between Tywin and Joffrey. Round one goes to Tywin, but Joffrey did land a few blows. Tywin doesn't plan to sacrifice Gregor Clegane to appease the Martells. Instead, he intends to frame Armor Lodge. 
Tyrion was sceptical that this would work. Lastly, he discovered that Roose Bolton's treachery has earned him the honorific of Warder of the North, and he's headed home with Arya Stark in tow. Tyrion is stunned by that news. McKelly, why don't we give them the summary of this one? All right. Well, Tyrion dresses in the dark while his young wife Sansa sleeps. He recalls the moment he told her about the awful fate of her brother Rob and her mother. Rather than burst into tears or promise revenge for their deaths, her face betrayed no emotion to the news. It was only later that he heard sobs through a door. Tyrion chose not to offer her comfort, figuring she would be uninterested in solace from a Lannister, even her own husband. He did spare her the details of the mutilation of the bodies post-mortem. Ultimately, Tyrion feels like a failure of a husband, being unable to protect his wife from this sadness. Tyrion thinks on the stark words, Winter is coming. It certainly has for House Stark. Only Sansa remains of the proud ancient house. In contrast, House Lannister is riding high on summer-like vibes. However, despite the hot streak for his house, Tyrion can't help but feel cold. One positive to come from his marriage is an upgrade in his housing situation. He's finally escaped sharing Magor's holdfast with Cersei, into spacious new digs in the kitchen keep. His household staff has grown as well. He's taken on Renly's former head of household, Brella. He's also hired Lolly Stokesworth's former maid, a young woman by the name of Shay. Yes, that Shay. Uh-oh. That sounds like trouble. Tyrion descends the stairs to a dark underground cellar. There he finds huge dragon skulls, and within the mouth of one such skull he finds Shay in nothing but her name day suit. She blows out his torch and makes Tyrion chase her for a bit in total darkness. When he catches her, they finish the primary purpose for their meeting, and then Shay asks Tyrion what troubles him. His list is long and contains basically the entirety of the small council, king included, of course. The list ends with the sight of the reflection of his own face. Shay defends the last item. She finds his face brave, kind, and good. She wishes she could see it now. Tyrion is struck by the sweet innocence in her voice. However, he quickly reminds himself that there is no innocence in Shay. He berates himself as a fool for buying into it. He thinks back to Lord Varys' warning when Tyrion took Shay into Sansa's service. The backstory Varys provided for Shay was meant for the Stokeworths, not to hold up against any probing Cersei might do into it. Tyrion figures if Cersei comes to Varys for info on Shay that Varys will come up with a clever lie. Varys disabuses Tyrion of that notion. If asked about Shay by the Queen, Varys will roll on Tyrion with no hesitation. He has no choice. His information is the only thing that makes him useful and therefore keeps him protected. He doesn't have Big Brother Jaime or Bronn to keep him safe. Tyrion knows Varys was right. His connection to Shay is too risky for both parties, not to mention the guilt of cheating on his new bride. He questions his feelings of guilt. Sansa has no interest in him. Maybe he could tell her. Possibly she'd be happy that someone else is tending to the task, sparing her from it. Ultimately, he decides it's a bad idea. Sansa has a track record of lo having loose lips when it comes to secrets. He knows the only thing to do is remove Shay from the situation. Possibly to Chitaya's brothel. Or he could marry her off. Bronn would jump at the chance. Or maybe Sir Tallard. Tyrion has seen the way Tallard looks at her. But who's he kidding? He's not going to send her away. He enjoys her company too much. The pair share a final kiss, and Shay professes her love for Tyrion before exiting the cellar. Tyrion thinks she might be a whore, but she deserves better than what he can offer. He decides he'll wed her to Sir Tallard. He seems like a good man, and he's tall. Well, that was a short chapter. I think it was only about six pages on my e-reader or so. It, it, it's not the most necessarily impactful chapter, ex except for that we learn that he has now moved Shay into his own apartments, which, uh, you know, feels like it, it, he's even aware that it could be problematic. But I guess we'll get to that part later in the chapter. And uh, we could just start at the top with, you know, one of the first things he tells us is that... Um, 
he's the one that got the unfortunate job of having to tell Sansa that her brother and mother were murdered at the twins. And uh, that's terrible. That's a terrible job to, to have and terrible news for Sansa. At this point, must think she is the last of the star. Yeah, you know, right. Like that's, I, I assume that's what most of the public thinks. But then last, the last Tyrion chapter, it pretty much ended with, Tywin saying, oh, and Bruce Bolton is, has Arya Stark and he's going to take her north and marry her to his bastard son, Ramsay. And Tyrion is like, what? <laughs> I thought she was dead. So it's unclear who knows that Arya, who thinks that Arya is with Ramsay or with um, Bruce and who thinks she's dead. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine Sansa's got many allies and people willing to tell her things unless um you know she's uh, um, she's making friends with the staff the household staff that she's got but otherwise she's probably not got a lot of sources of information other than Tyrion really right and you know as you say that it might have been a good way to soften the blow a little bit by saying oh but wait i learned that your sister is alive and with Roose Bolton so She's been discovered. She's been found, and she is alive and well. Definitely, yeah. That would could, certainly could have helped at some point. Um, but he didn't even mention that to her. He just uh, he left her to her grief. Yeah, we don't know. At least, I mean, you would think if he told her that Arya was alive, he would. We would have gotten that thought as he was thinking about the whole scene over again. So, it doesn't seem like he would have. But yeah, it certainly might have helped a bit. And you know, we had wondered. At the time, what kind of news would get out about the Red Wedding? You know, we, we had wondered, um, would the phrase put out a false narrative or would they own up to what they did? You know, uh, as far as the, the public face of the word that got out of the twins, because there really wasn't many Stark supporters that are going to be disseminating information outside of the twins. So it was basically up to them to uh, disseminate what happened there. To the victor goes yeah, the, uh, I, you know, the vic was the saying, uh, history is written by the victors or something like that, right? So, <laughs> very, very much so. Yeah, I mean, from the last chapter with uh, with Tywin, um, they, they didn't seem to be hiding particularly their role in it. They were, um, and obviously they might want to put out a more public face to it, but uh, but you would you would think that if there's two stories going about, they would. Uh, people are going to think the worst rather than right. the best. So uh, I, I, I don't think, I don't think the phrase really mind one way or the other. They've done their job. They've, they've done what they've been asked to do. So, well, yeah. And they've aligned with the, the family of the King. So I guess maybe they feel like they're, they're protected from any kind of, uh, you know, blowback that might come from such a dishonorable way of, of handling guest right. Absolutely, yeah. That's it, that was possibly their only uh, the only thing they could be thinking of is the desecration of that particular right. But if that it's a choice between following their king or that, then they, they, that is no choice, right? And, and they can they can frame it in that way if they like as well. Yeah, it you know as co conspirators, we're getting this info from a Lannister from the Lannister family in general. As co-conspirators, you you would think that the news might be more accurate than what the rest of the realm is hearing. Um, but in that Davos chapter on Dragonstone, it began with Salador San telling Robert or telling Stannis and Davos and the rest in the room pretty much accurate information about what happened at the uh, you know at the twins, and he got that from basically the scuttlebutt at the port of King's Landing. So, we're, you know, mm. what seems like fairly accurate information is is getting out. Yeah, I just can't see that. There's uh, there's not going to be anything to be gained for the, I mean, for the phrase to say it was any, any other, you know, it was some accident or, you know, party that got out of hand. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we invited too many Dothraki. That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they've been asked to do a they, well. They were they were given a, a task to do, so they want to make sure that the king and uh, the small council know that they followed through on it. So, um, yeah, there's no benefit for them to hide it behind 
obviously to the to the general public and to all the lords they may have they may have some sort of um concerns but they're probably just looking up right now and thinking nope king says king gets i guess so it's a little bit a li- they could have framed it in a way you know that was less of a black eye to their reputation but i guess they they figure what do we have to lose at this point i I don't know i guess we'll see we we haven't heard anything from the twins and i don't think we have any povs left there so we'll have (laughs) to see aria is usually the one that's out in the realm that gets the the small the small folks take on things so we'll have to hear if there's any other versions of that story getting around yeah yeah. So we get a little bit of an explanation of why Cat's body was thrown into the into the river, um, which uh, appears to be a um, a mockery of a right. of a Tully um, funeral rite, which again it just all seems a little unnecessary to be fair. But um, right, yeah, because I don't know if that was part of the request, you know, the humiliation of the bodies afterwards, or um, but it's a. Uh, it just seems a bit grotesque and a bit, uh, well, I'd say unnecessary. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, why? You've already violated one of the most sacred rules in the Seven Kingdoms by breaking guests' right, and then you mutilate and, uh, you know, just desecrate their their corpses. It It's just, on your, as you said, it's just unnecessary. And and when you think of when you think of um, some of the some of the battles where people get you know they they actually request for the the corpses of their you know fallen um, fallen knights to be returned so that they can give them proper burials and they are actually honoured. It just seems a, a a strange a strange thing to do. And it, it what what was the what was the reasoning behind it? You know what what was the you know for a further humiliation? Right. I mean possibly the. The humiliation with with Rob's body is different, but by Cat's body, it just uh, it doesn't seem. You know, you'd think it would be something that would just be returned to the family and let them deal with it. But right, perhaps they're thinking there's no family left. Or... Oh yeah, that that's possible. Yeah, they they think Sansa's the only one left. Well, they might know about Arya because Roose Bolton's there, so they they might oh, think yeah. that that Roose actually has Arya. Uh, but, but yeah, I guess part of it is the fact that you know that. Uh, they were felt betrayed by Rob Stark, but I mean, killing him should even that up. You know, I don't know that you <laughs> need to desecrate his body on top of everything else. But yeah, so so Tyrion decides not to console Sansa and figures that she wouldn't want that from a Lannister. What do you think? Do you think she he was right in that assumption? Yeah, I, he's he's made some decisions about his relationship with Sansa, and and he's. He certainly put the the fact that he's a Lannister as, as part of that as part of his decision making process. Um, whether she's thinking that or not, I don't. I, you, you just don't know because you don't know whether she's you know ready to just suck it up and and play her role. Or um, but obviously this particular uh, this particular moment, like you said in the final in the last in the last Tyrion chapter, um, it's probably not the best moment to try and consummate the marriage. Right um, as he's. As he's giving this information to her, um, I, I think he's right. To be honest, I don't think she would want anything to do with him, um, or anyone would want anything to do with somebody who's just given them that information. It's uh, she. She's not that they don't have a relationship like a, a caring couple. I think they're both certainly Tyrion's going into it with his eyes more wide open. Whether Sansa's thinking about you know eventually coming round to him or not. We don't know. We haven't heard from Sansa. I think we're going to hear a little bit more about her feelings in the next chapter. Right. But um, she's a. She just seems to be. Um, yeah, it, it's. Just, it, I don't think. I don't think he was right or wrong to not do it. It was just done something that probably wasn't a good idea anyway. Yeah. In, in fact, I was. If I'd have been in his position, I would have probably try to get out of there as quickly as possible. Yeah. Uh, you know, he has made some overtures toward her. He. He asked her if he could come to the Godswood with her sometime, and she quickly rejected that. And of course, we have a hunch why that is. But yeah, is that, is that because she's going to pray, or is she actually going to meet Dantas? Right. Um, still. Uh... Yeah, yeah. He mentions 
uh, Tyrion mentions in this chapter that she's been going nightly to the Godswood. So yeah, as I see it, there's a there's a only a very few options here. Either she's going there nightly and having intricate conversations with Dauntus about a new escape plan. Because remember, last time she said, "Oh, I don't need your escape plan anymore. I'm marrying Willis Tyrell." That was the last we've heard from Dauntus. That's now <laughs> out the window. So. Is she trying to get a new plan in place? So possibly that's happening. Or she's going nightly in hopes of seeing Dantos, hoping he's going to show up one of these days. Or, yeah, because he, he he just followed what she said and then, well, you don't need me. <laughs> right, yeah. I'm going to go get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> or, or she could honestly be looking for a place to get away from Lannisters. And we know her life is in pretty serious turmoil right now, so maybe she actually is praying to the old gods as often as possible. So, uh, mm-hmm. But the way she shut Tyrion down so quick certainly makes you think that she's at least hoping to see Dantos and doesn't want him around ruining that. So Yeah, she was, there, was, there was never... A, it, it, she was very quick to, to say no to that. So yeah. you'd, think that, you'd think that either she's protecting the, the chance meeting or she's actually meeting and she doesn't want to be discovered. Right. And, and Tyrion wonders... If she's going there to pray for his death, and I don't think so. I I don't think so. I mean, Joffrey, Cersei, Tywin, yes, I I could certainly see her doing that. But I think she's probably aware enough to see that Tyrion is is different from those three, and he's trapped in the marriage just like she is. Now he she doesn't know that Tyrion has. Shay on the side that he actually loves but he did say to her before they got married this wasn't my idea you know I, I'm being forced into this as much as you are so and, and he has honored the word that he made on their uh, wedding night not to touch her until she wants him to touch her so you know yeah it's a it's an odd one that it's um it, We'll touch a bit later on it as well, but it's it's another one because what age is, is Sansa? I know I know the ages are different in in the in the um, in this world, but um, she she thirteen or fourteen or something. She's like that. twelve at last check. If she's had a birthday, <sighs> we have not heard about it. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, she's. <laughs> He's he's still quite a grotesque figure, right? You know, and it's certainly with the wound uh, from from the battle, he's even more grotesque, and it, that must be quite scary for a young girl that age. True. You yeah. know, I, I, whilst whilst sure. he, she may hate the others for the things they've done, he's actually quite a physically um, disturbing character, and for all him being nice, I, um, you know, young girls can be, <laughs> and I'm sure young boys as well. Um, very scared of a creature like that. Um, yes, and it, right. and it just w- won't help. Yeah, I, that's a very valid point. And I think my mind, because Peter Dinklage played Tyrion in the show, and Peter Dinklage is a is a good looking guy. The the way they yes. describe Tyrion in the book, he's he's not he doesn't appear to be as nearly as good looking as Tyrion Lannister. I mean, as <laughs> Tyrion Lannister, as uh, Peter Dinklage. Peter Dinklage. Yes. So yeah, I think you very. That's a very solid point there. Absolutely. So um, Tyrion he compares the House Stark and the House Lannister um, in that, and the words of the House Stark that winter winter is coming, but for the Lannisters, it's nothing but sunshine. <laughs> but he's not feeling much of that heat. No. <laughs> Because it does look from 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 outside um, and from inside as well. It looks pretty bleak for the Starks. There's only, as far as a lot of people are concerned, there's only Sansa um, left alive of the legitimate family. Um, but in reality, it's not quite as bad as that. There's um, Arya is still alive. Um, the uh, Bran's still alive, and we presume Rickon's still alive. <laughs> That's true. At last check, he was still alive. Anyway, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> He's 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 Rickon. I'm not sure he can be killed that easily. <laughs> yeah, you know, and Tyrion ticks off all that Sansa's lost. You know, early in this chapter, she, he he's thinking about how uh, how rough of a go she's had of it. She's lost her home, her place in the world, everyone she's ever trusted, and you know, now she just lost 
just very recently lost uh, her mother and uh, older brother. So yeah, she thinks she is the last trueborn Stark. So uh, you know, because yeah. unless unless we didn't hear, and really she has been told that Arya is with uh, Roose Bolton, which we know, of course, is not true. Uh, she thinks she's all that's left. Maybe, maybe she did. Maybe she did, and she went. Oh, that's all I need to know. <laughs> Couldn't have been someone else. <laughs> 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 and uh, you know, John believes that it's just Sansa as well, um, unless yeah. unless Sam Sam corrects him after uh, meeting Bran at the Night Fort. So you know, Sam could help John out by. By telling him, oh, it's not just Sansa. You actually have your brother, uh, Bran, is alive too. And I still think Bran should have told Sam that Rickon was alive last he saw Rickon. That Rickon did not die in the sack of Winterfell. Or beforehand, <laughs> yeah. at, the, at the hand of uh, Dion Greyjoy. It, it seems like he should share that. <laughs> to be honest, uh, he, he didn't share it and John probably didn't ask. <laughs> yeah. He, afterward, now that he's on the northern side of the wall, he was like, I should have mentioned to Sam about Rickon. What? <laughs> but he forgot. <laughs> what else can you John expect? Just said, Rick and who? <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Tyrion's not, he's not really sharing in the family heat right now. And, uh, you know, he's definitely fallen off his perch a bit, a bit since the Blackwater. That was kind of like, like the pinnacle of his success as Hand of the King was the Blackwater. When he was out there, like, you know, leading troops and, you know, r- riding around, killing people with a battle axe. And uh, it's basically been all downhill. He's lost his job as Hand of the King, made to marry a girl he doesn't love and that doesn't love him. He can't openly be with the woman that he does love. And his father keeps leaving him out of plans and decision and decisions and telling him news after the fact. And, uh, you know, later he does tick off all these, all these woes that he's dealing with. And, and not the least of which uh, that's happened to him since, uh, you know, since the Blackwater is that it was because of him that the city and his family were saved by his actions and planning on the Blackwater. And he got no credit for it. So, yeah, he did. He didn't enjoy a particularly. Uh, he was. He was. He was on his back for quite a while, wasn't he? Yeah, after, right. afterwards because of his injury. So he he missed that opportunity to actually take the, the 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 kudos for the for the success. And probably by the time he was back on his feet, it was all, you know, yeah, that's last week's news. What have you done for us recently? <laughs> yeah, and his father sure wasn't uh, afraid to step in. And not that his father didn't help. He, he did. They rode to the. To the rescue and defeated Stannis' yeah, yeah. army, but to, there wouldn't have been any ride to the rescue if Tyrion hadn't done what Tyrion did. So, uh, you know, but as you say, as you say that you know, the victors will write history, and and if if Tywin's there and he's he's done what he's done, he's not gonna he's not gonna call out the the other good things that people do. Right. He's just gonna say hey, this was all down to me, and right. and nobody else is here to say any different. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, he literally rode into. Uh, the throne room, you know, after <laughs> after the uh, fighting and all that, on a white horse. <laughs> he literally Precise. came in on a white horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but because... It, <laughs> Subtlety. <laughs> yeah, right. Because in this chapter, it, it was another chapter where he was laying post-coital with Shay, it reminded me of the chapter where he was laying with Shay, thinking about how he's got the job and he's got the woman and you know everything is is on is looking up for <laughs> one Tyrion Lannister, and uh, yeah, it's it's a far cry from when he took stock of his life back then. Indeed, indeed. But now at least he's been moved to a larger apartment. True. He's got a better house, and he's away from Cersei's prying eyes, which is a uh, quite important for him. Yeah, I I I find I find his relationship with Varys to be very peculiar. Um, he knows who Varys is. He knows what Varys' job is. Varys has told him he is he's spying for Tywin. Right, right. On him. Um, and 
um, as Ferris makes it quite clear in this chapter, he says, I have to keep um, keep these people happy because um, I'm not related. I don't have a I don't have a cell sword to protect me. I have to keep all the information um, as pertinent and and be as useful as possible. Right. And yet, for some reason, Tyrion is trusting him with some of his most important secrets. Absolutely. I, I just and I it, I was going to suggest it as pedantry, but it's down to character decisions and writing, really. But I can't understand why Tyrion is. He's allowing himself to be to for some of the most important things in his in his life. Damning things. Varys. Some of the most damning yeah. things, yeah. And, and and Varys has told him he won't lie for him, he won't lie to Cersei for him. He doesn't mention whether he'll lie to Tywin for him, but if uh, you think the same would apply. I agree. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It... So it just seems it, so strange that he would he would A let him know so much about Shay. Right. Um, obviously, in the, in the previous chapter, he arranged the meeting for them um, at in his own in in Varys's own room, but now it's uh, Tyrion, Tyrion's allowed uh, Varys to basically put in a, a what could potentially be an agent of his in his own household because he's given them um, Brella uh, under Var- Varys Varys's suggestion has brought Bell- Brella to run the household. Now this is the former head of Renly's household, and he's, uh, Varys has, come, has suggested her because she's uh, she's good at being blind, deaf, and mute, uh, which could suggest that Varys was getting information about Renly and his sexuality. Oh yes, from her. right. That, that's that's an interpretation of it. Um, but I was uh, I was very surprised that someone as cunning or as seemingly intelligent as as Tyrion is letting himself open to such possibilities with Varys. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd hire someone recommended by Varys. I, and I'm not sure, I mean, if, if I think about it, I'm not sure necessarily matters entirely because he's, Varys probably has spies everywhere. I'm just so, I'm surprised he's so open about it, you know? <laughs> well, may, but maybe that's it. Maybe it's two intelligent people who just recognise that the you know there's no point to to the games, but the the one thing is that that Varys has said openly to T- Tyrion that he won't lie to Cersei, and right, at least make it slightly difficult for him. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. But uh, that umbrella wasn't the only uh, new staff member hired, as you mentioned in the summary. Shay was also hired away from the Stokeworths and boy that feels risky uh, absolutely I mean from from both points of view from the point of view for various letting various know so much about about his life but for he's he's bringing Shay over to his house he knows the risk he knows he's being watched and monitored by his father he knows Cersei's digging for something right um and why why put her in the firing line like that? Yeah. Um, Things keep moving in the wrong direction. I mean, she started out in a manse, uh, you know, kind of on the far, on the outskirts of town. And yeah, then yeah. that seemed unsafe for her there. Next thing you know, she is in in the Red Keep at the Stokeworths and uh, or, uh, working for the Stokeworths. So now she's in the Red Keep with Tyrion. And then from there, she's now in his apartments. I mean, there, it's going in the wrong direction from his stated goal of wanting to separate the, themselves to keep both of them safe, but especially her safe. Yeah, I mean, Tyrion's all over the all over the map on this in this particular chapter and in the last chapter with Shay as well, because he's um, we obviously get quite intimate details about um about the relationship actually this episode was was relatively um um free of it which i was quite happy about <laughs> um compared to the last chapter which was quite descriptive right um but um it, you 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 don't know whether it's post coital thoughts he's having or uh, but he, he one, at one moment he's thinking i've definitely got to get rid of her and then as the chapter goes on, he's starting to think, "Oh, I do love her, and and I want to keep her safe." And and then he's trying to think of the best ways to do that. And it just, uh, he he just seems a little bit, um, a little bit lost. And as you say, bringing her over here just seems to be incredibly risky. Just a, a, a 
it just puts himself and especially her in debt. I don't suppose Tywin's going to threaten to kill Ty- Tyrion about this, but he's certainly threatened to kill the next prostitute he finds. Right. Yeah. Right. That she is certainly in more danger than he is as far as um her life goes. Absolutely. But and you know, and I wonder, I wonder how Shay is around Sansa. I wonder if there's any outward jealousy or malice towards Santa does she hold a grudge against her now that she is one of her handmaids is 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 there anything that Sansa could pick up on any that anybody else could pick up on is that is that something that um that either Sansa is is it going to be interested in um I mean because again it comes back to you know a 12 year old 13 year old girl is she is she gonna is she gonna think well I don't want him but I don't want anybody else to touch him either. Um, is she gonna be that it, that uh, sophisticated enough to think you know oh it's a it's a slur on my marriage and a slur on my my person is that he's sleeping with a prostitute or is she gonna even notice it? Or if, and as as he mentions you know she she may even be happy that someone else is dealing with that side of him, um, that she, so she doesn't have to. Right. Yes. That's that is. Certainly a possibility, uh, you know, and, and she goes along right now with pretty much anything. She's she's learned to to play the, the game, just uh, be agreeable and use courtesy as her armor. So if he did tell her, I guess it's possible she could, you know. Yeah, that's the question. What would she do with that information? I mean because surely just telling someone that your husband is sleeping with a prostitute is not going to it's not going to look well on you as the wife in in that in those circumstances and nobody's going to say well in that case he let's slap him in irons and take him to the dungeon they're just um right the only person who's going to raise an eyebrow at that is going to be Tywin right does uh, yes. does does Sansa know that does Sansa have that that information I don't think so um, I don't think she but, is aware but obviously she wouldn't know to not say anything. Right. Um, yes. If 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 Tyrion told her, he'd have to say you can't tell anybody or, you know. And that gives her the power at that point. True. That yes, it. it does. Yes, it does. Yeah. It. You know, the irony is, is that he discounts it. He discounts telling her because uh, he doesn't trust her ability to keep secrets. And he remembers about how she's the one that spilled Ned's plans, spilled the beans uh, on Ned's plan to get her and Arya out on the ship to Cersei, which landed her in the situation she's been in ever since of basically being a captive here. But the and the ironic thing is, to think she'd learn yeah, from <laughs> And the ironic thing is, is that she's been sitting on this escape plan with Dauntus, not telling a soul. So, you know, <laughs> she she's she's got a blemish on her record, but I feel like she's upped her game a good bit, you know? <laughs> Well, yeah, and again, you know, at the time, what, 11, 12-year-old girl who who didn't know any better and genuinely thought she was doing the right thing. Right, yeah, yeah, she was uh, in love, I, you know, it's it's understandable. Yeah, yeah she, she was betrothed to the king and um, and, and has been brought up in a, an honourable system by an honourable father right. who says you must, you know, obey these people and thought she was doing the right thing. She's probably learned a lot more now. I'm sure, and yes. With the, with the right information from uh, from Tyrion you know it, it could work out well for both of them but night um, obviously Sansa doesn't know anything and, and Tyrion isn't in a position to trust her so right yeah uh, so it, and it, it, it's it's an awkward one it's um I, I don't think it would be a good idea particularly to to um I agree in, involve involve Sansa but then again I don't think it was a good idea to bring Varys in there, so. <laughs> right <laughs> And speaking of Varys, he mentions that the cover story that he set up for Shay was only for the Stokeworths. It's, it's not the same level of complexity necessary to full Cersei. Although his plan to full Cersei by using Chitaya's brothel as a, you know, um, kind of as a decoy for meeting Shay, that worked. Yeah. That worked pretty well, much to the detriment of Ali Yaya. So <laughs> yeah. Cersei's not necessarily a super sleuth, but this time there's no human shield for Shay like Aliyaya was playing. Yeah, and I think I'll probably Varys's concern in that is if she if Cersei does find out, then Cersei will also know that Varys didn't tell her the truth yes. about 
the original one. That's and so obviously Varys is looking out for himself, as he said clearly. Right. You know, he's looking yeah. out. He needs to be trusted by Cersei. Yeah. If that that comes out, he can. So I suppose in a little way, he has a little. He has a problem um, that you know he's damned if he does and he's damned if he doesn't. Right. Because if he if he lets Cersei find out that. Um, I suppose the only thing you can say is, "Well, I'm letting you know now. Right um, now, is, now, now is the right time to tell you, rather than before." But it, it, it's it's a, it is an awkward one, and I just think I just think two intelligent people like Tyrion and, and Varys, who are uh, what schemers and you know and know how to play the game, are possibly both putting themselves in a difficult um, a difficult situation. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, is is it is it just love on Tyrion's part? Um, certainly, that that's not going to be affecting Varys in any way. But uh, yeah. Tyrion seems to be blinded. Yeah, and Varys has already been scooped once by Littlefinger about the Sansa Willis wedding plans because that's yeah. who brought that information to Tywin. So probably Varys doesn't want to be scooped again by this one. You know, it, someone else finding out and telling Cersei that uh, or or Tywin, what Tyrion and Shay are up to. So it, it's a tricky spot for him here. Yeah. So as we move on the chapter, um, we get more information about um, the, the rendezvous between Shay and uh, and Tyrion. And as I say, it's not quite as graphic as the previous one. But, <laughs> um, lots of the same things sort of happen. Um, and... Tyrion does seem to start to have um, doubts and uh, guilt about Sansa, and he also has um, some guilt about putting Shay in danger. Tyrion seems to me to be a, a relatively decent person, and I'm using the word relatively compared to his relatives. <laughs> um, but but he's, he's, he's clearly flawed. Um, but he's, he's refusing, he's, he is refusing to take advantage of the marriage situation, even though he is attracted to Sansa and he says so, and he could probably force the issue if he chose to, but he's not doing. Um, right. Instead, right. He's, 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 he's sleeping with Shay, who he genuinely cares for, and despite his thoughts to the contrary, seems to truly be in love with him. Um, yeah, that's what she says. Perhaps, again, it's difficult to put the... The, the values and morals of the Song of Ice and Fire world um, as to why Tyrion seems to have such a cynical view of Shay's feelings. She's a prostitute. She shouldn't, you know, she, she just walk away. I, I think she genuinely seems to love him, but we don't have her point of view, obviously. Right. When we get the things that she says. She just seems that, I, I don't know, he, she, he, he, there was, there was some mention in the previous, um, in a previous uh, chapter with uh, Tyrion and Shay um, it was chapter twelve, I think, and t- um, she was uh, she was talking to Varys, or there was a conversation with Varys and her, and she wanted to know where she'd get her jewels and her silks back. Right. Um, yes. If 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 um, if Tyrion didn't survive, or he was killed in battle, so she does obviously have her eye on the the, the jewels and the things um, in her life, but. She certainly seems to just be talking about. She she understands the dangers. She's been it's been explained to her, um, and she still wants to be with him. So, is it a a risk? If it's a risk she's willing to take, should he should he not let her? And or you know, I, I, it's a, as I say, yins and yangs during this uh, during the chapter, which seems to have something to do with his um, position. Well. Position is not the word I'm looking for. Um, his condition, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's certainly. She certainly is giving all the impression that that she truly loves Tyrion, but I think he's struggling one because he, I think he lacks belief that anyone could truly love him. Yeah, and, yeah, and that's understandable. <laughs> right? Yeah, and, and um, you know, I think deep down. He he really wants to believe it, but I think deep down he remembers their original agreement that this was a business transaction. You know, you you're going to be my woman. You're not going to sleep with anyone else. This is a I, I'm going to take care of you, and you are going to have sex with me. That was you know kind of the original agreement, and I think he feels like he's been duped before with Taisha 
he, you know, his first wife, he thought she loved him. They got married. And then, you know, he's told by his father that actually his brother, Jamie, she was a prostitute and Jamie paid her to pretend to be in love with Tyrion to, uh, you know, make him feel better about himself. So, you know, possibly that's weighing on his mind as well, you know, that, nope, this is, I've had this happen to me before. I'm not going to fall for it again. She doesn't really love me, just like Taisha didn't really love me. Yes, yeah, yeah, precisely. It's a, the sum of his experiences to be, is to keep this at arm's length if he can. Right. But, um, yeah. But he's not doing a very good job of that if he is. No, he's not. And, and then, you know, the chapter ends with him deciding... He go, he's going back and forth. Now, the right thing to do is to let her go. Well, I say this all the time, but really I know I'm not going to let her go. And then, you know, she says she loves him and kisses him goodbye and leaves. And he thinks, no, she deserves better than what I can offer her. I'm going to marry her to Sir Tallard. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see whether that holds or not. Right as the chapter ended, he might have thought, nah, actually, I'm not going to. Uh, so yeah yeah i mean he'd gone through a list he was going to he was going to wed her to to uh to Bron and just just to keep him just so that she could be safe and have a have a good life Bron's a knight now so why not but um he, he chooses to tell her because he's a good man and he's tall which possibly suggests something like you say something more about him being self-conscious and right. thinking about inadequacy things that she might really want yeah yeah but uh, the the thing is, it, it she um, is this something that Shay's going to accept? Or right, she does she get a say in this? Right, yeah. And, and uh, another option was he thought about sending her to Chataya's brothel. I mean, you'd think she would get a say in that for sure. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I guess I guess we'll have to see. It seems like he's really struggling with. He knows some. He knows it's dangerous. He's a smart man. He knows he's playing with fire here. Does he have the ability to let go of something he loves for her safety? Someone, not something, someone he loves for her safety. Yeah, and, and at the end of the day, he needs to make some decisions about that because he's in and he, he's he's toing and froing all the time about this. Right. You know, he, he he has a he has it in mind, then he decides not to do it, and uh, it, it, it's he needs to. Maybe make a decision when he's either just been satisfied or <laughs> had a nice cold shower. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Try and take uh, his uh, sexual desires out of it as much as possible. <laughs> so let's move on to background. Um, so the dragons, Balerion and Vagar, get a mention in this chapter as Shay and Tyrion that's some, meet in that's the room. Impressive background, by the way, because like I said, this was a very difficult chapter to get anything out. Of. <laughs> yes, it was. I struggled mightily with where I was going to get background from. So, yeah. So uh, Tyrion and Shay meet in the room where the skulls are stored, which happens to be the same room that Arya ended up in when she ran away from those guards before hearing Illyrio uh, and yes. uh, Varys's conversation. Anyway, uh, so Balerion and Vagar are possibly the two most famous dragons in uh, Westerosi history. They're definitely the two largest dragons ever known on the continent. Balerion the Black Dread being the largest dragon ever to take wing over the realm. And Vagar was not too far behind in size by the time she died. And also Vagar has been featured in House of the Dragon, so she gets fame from that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is another dragon skull in that room that Tyrion doesn't mention that I wanted to put the spotlight on for a few minutes here. So Meraxes lived alongside Balerion and Vagar her whole life. And, and whereas Balerion was ridden by Aegon the Conqueror and Vagar ridden by Visenya, Meraxes was ridden by their younger sister, Rhaenys. And we told you back in Arya 3 of A Game of Thrones how Meraxes was hit by a scorpion bolt through her eye over Hellholt during the first Dornish War, and that both she and Rhaenys perished when they fell from the sky. But at the time of her death, Meraxes was actually bigger than Vagar, although not quite as large as Balerion. Uh, so we've talked about her death, so today I wanted to share a story of her life. Once Aegon began his conquest of Westeros in earnest, one of the first things he did after landing on what would become Aegon Fort and then later King's Landing was to send his sisters out to begin subduing castles. 
logically starting nearby, Rosby submitted to Rainey's and Meraxis without pretty much any struggle at all. However, next up for the dynamic duo was a much bigger fish. The pair headed for Storm's End alongside Oris Baratheon, who's Aegon's Hand of the King. The mission was to bring Argilac Durandon, the last Storm King, into the fold. The fight that ensued was known as the Battle of the Last Storm. And true to Storm's End's personality, a storm raged over the castle during the battle, which did keep Meraxes and Rhaenys grounded. But even a grounded dragon is a dangerous one. Meraxes took out Argilac's entire vanguard with her dragon flame. Now, King Argilac himself faced Oris Baratheon one-on-one and died in the duel. And after that, Rhaenys then flew into the castle and parlayed with Argilac's daughter, Argella. Aegon gave Storm's End to Oris Baratheon for his efforts, as well as Princess Argella for his bride. So, there we go. Two things from that, just just questions from me, uh, really. Um, one is, why does a storm ground a dragon? What's the reasoning for that? I guess the wind must must have been too strong for even a dragon to be able to hold uh, flight pattern, I guess. Okay, okay. And then, and also flying into a castle to parley, I think is quite a um, a, a boss move. <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, <laughs> parleying while you're on the back of a dragon is probably yes. not quite as <laughs> you 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 you'd think that she has the upper hand in all uh, negotiation there. <laughs> but I did find it interesting. <laughs> Everything she couldn't she couldn't fly Meraxes during the battle, but as soon as the battle was over, she man it must have been like a quick jump over the the walls yeah. of Storm's yeah. End, you know. Yeah, yeah. So comparisons with the TV show. Thank you to Simon for putting this together before he departed on vacation. Tyrion saw Sansa crying before he had a chance to break the news to her. Varys talks to Shay and offers her money to get out of town. She bridles and tells Varys that Tyrion should ask her himself. Later, Sansa, now fully aware of the gruesome details of her family's murders, heads off to the Godswood. Tyrion finds Shay in his marital bed. He resists her charms and she confronts him about Varys' payoff but he claims to have had nothing to do with that. As she leaves the chamber, a sneaky-looking servant notices. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, Simon. I don't know if, that'll come, don't know if that's going to come back into play, but... Uh... Right, we don't know of any sneaking-looking servants noticing anything yet, but, you know, that's why we compare the book to the TV show, because a lot of times the storylines diverge. So we'll have to yeah. keep an eye I think on that. There must be some. There must be some sort of. Um, there's quite a lot of, of links, I think, to the to the chapter there. It's probably quite similar. There's the the various paying her off is 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 a, a, a version of it, I suppose. But um, it's uh, it does seem. You'd think that you'd think that um, Tyrion would have asked for Varys to to do that, right? Um, rather than rather than Varys just doing it on his own, off his own back, of his own volition, because I don't yeah. think it benefits Varys to do that in any way. Um, the only thing true. that does is help, help help Tyrion. Yeah. So, well, as you say, we'll have to find out a little bit more as the TV programme goes on about that. Yeah. So, Pedantry Corner. I The, the only things for me were, were a few character choices, which um, I don't think, they, they certainly can't go down as pedantry. And it's such a short chapter with... Um, the, the the scenes in it are so limited that there's nothing really to I, I was desperately looking to see if the sun ra- rose at the wrong time or something like that but <laughs> no, none of it did I couldn't go into into any of your um, drinking water from upstream of the sewage system <laughs> uh, which by the way was an absolutely A plus um, <laughs> right no what what was what was your what was your pedantry from last week? Uh, that was it, wasn't it? That it was, was the... Simon's pedantry. My oh, in that case, that was in that case, that was a B. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of what mine was off the top of my head. Oh, it yours was... was excellent, and he gave you an A minus or something. Did, I was never... <laughs> yes, and I just edited this episode like a few days ago. Uh, what was it? It was. Um... Oh yes, it was Danny, who's never been to Westeros, diagnosing the. Uh, the heroes work with a lance as being Westerosi jousting technique. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful, <laughs> perfect pedantry. I was I was impressed, and I was expecting an A plus, and then 
I don't know what it was. It must have been presentation or something. I guess, yeah, that's that's probably what it was. I will say I was a little bit nervous for them when they were running around in playing Monsters and Maidens in cave-like darkness with all these dragon teeth. Dragon teeth. <laughs> that seems yeah. like a really bad idea. <laughs> I'm not saying it's pedantry, but I'm saying that was they got awfully lucky that nothing happened to either of them. <laughs> Precisely, yeah. So, news and notes. Uh, not, there's not much. Uh, just reminder that there will be no episode next week, uh, August 15th. Hello. I know. We will be back on August the 22nd, August the 21st for sustainers, of course. And uh, we have a review. Would you like to uh, to read a review for us? Yes, so this review comes from Momonsky uh, via podchaser.com. An amazing podcast. I'm someone that rereads books a lot, and recently I was thinking about reading again A Sword of Ice and Fire, but I didn't have the courage to do so. But then I find you guys. Your interactions are hilarious. The content <laughs> is well researched, and I love the background. I can't really follow audiobooks, so your format worked perfectly for me. I listen while doing chores in the house, work out, and sometimes while working. All right. I I listen while I'm doing a lot of uh, cutting the grass. To be fair, and chasing bees, uh, and chasing bees. <laughs> well, <laughs> I take the I take the sound out then because I need to know where they're coming from. I'm currently binging the whole show, and I might get up to speed quite soon. Can't wait to hear the rest. Cheers. Well, thank you, Momonski, and um, they they do they do deserve all the credit. I I listen via um, Google okay uh, podcast, and it doesn't allow me to put. Um, to put uh, comments uh, because otherwise I would do one every week. Oh, right. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate <laughs> Mamonsky. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic review. It made me smile. And we love hearing what people do while they listen to us. So that was very cool. Uh, all right. Shall we wrap this up? Yeah. So Sansa and Tyrion's marriage still seems to be stuck in neutral. That it does. <laughs> Shay, who is now in service to Tyrion and Sansa, Whose idea was that? And <laughs> it feels like Tyrion and Shay's relationship keeps getting more and more dangerous. Yeah, you know, Tyrion and Sansa, they there seems to be this continued cold politeness. You know, they they seem to interact in a very cordial manner. You know, there's no shouting or yelling or any emotions at all, except for Sansa crying on the other side of a door. Uh he Tyrion was probably right that Sansa didn't want him to con, to comfort her. Uh, maybe he could keep trying to make small efforts if he does want to make a go at this marriage. You know, he did ask her, "Could I come to the Godswood with you?" Uh, she quickly rejected that. But you know, maybe just small gestures. I don't know that it'll ever get to a place of love between the two of them, but maybe they could get to a place of at least mutual respect. Yeah, and, and the question I suppose is gonna be how long is Tywin gonna accept that the this marriage hasn't borne any fruit? Um Right. Yes, that's gonna rear its head some at some point. And you know, it'd probably be best if they both go along with the story that they're trying. You know, that that uh probably would help if uh instead of saying no, we haven't tried yet. They say, we are trying. We just haven't had any luck yet. That'll buy them maybe a yeah. little more time. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Unless unless someone's going to come in and stand over while, uh, you know, to make sure you're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> right. That, yeah, that's very possible. That's very possible. That might be the next move if, uh, if nothing happens soon. And as far as your question about, you know, with, with Shay now in service to Tyrion and Sansa and whose idea with that was that, that is a good question. Did Tyrion think it was best to, to keep her close so at least they could be seen together if they were accidentally seen together? It would there'd be some level of uh, ability to uh, rationalize it and explain it away? Or did Shay convince him that she was tired of working for the Stokeworths and with Lullies and wanted to come work for him? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Who's who's pushing it? <laughs> Yeah, right. Either way, it's moving a step closer to the fire, if you ask me. We've got, like I said earlier, we've gone from her living in her own manse at the out, uh, outskirts of town to into the Red Keep with him and now into his own service. And it just feels like it's getting increasingly risky as they move in that direction. Yeah, and and 
more so. I mean, Shay's even suggesting that they drug Sansa and have sex next to her. Um, it's just yeah. more and more risky. I mean, there are some people who who like that in a in a sexual relationship, I suppose. Right. Um, right. The idea of getting caught and right it is uh, exciting. There's an excitement level to it, I guess. This is an excitement level, but the consequences for Shay are a little bit more than, you know, oh, we've been found out. And he, Tyrion, to his credit, has tried to explain that to her. He told her about what happened to Tysha. So, you know, we can't say that she hasn't been made aware of the the stakes here. But, you know, maybe she was just trying to lighten a dangerous situation by making a joke that they should do that. That's possible, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, But, you know... Next week, we're off to, uh, we're basically just going to go upstairs. We're going to go back up to the apartments in the kitchen keep, and we're going to see what Sansa's thinking about all this stuff. Well, uh, well it's going to be it's going to be interesting. We're hopefully, well, we'll probably find out what she does know about her family's, the, the state of the rest of her family. And, right, uh, right. And possibly, possibly we'll find out a little bit more about how she genuinely feels towards the marriage and what the what her situation is. Yes, it, it should be very, shall I say, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> <There you go. laughs> okay, there are four ways that you can help these two out. You can leave them a review. Uh, you can buy merchandise at ghostsofhanhall.threadless.com or you can buy them at Narba Gold at buymeacoffee.com ghosts Harren Hall or become a sustainer at Lord Paramount or Knight of the Realm level. Or if you want to donate to their cause through their website, it's ghostsofharrenhall.buzzsprout.com. And if you're looking for more ways to interact with us, keeping up with the latest Ghosts of Harrenhal news and developments, well, check us out on our social medias. You can follow us on Twitter at Ghost Harrenhal. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.